So we talked about what's going on in Ottawa. Let's jump in. And I know you have all mounted that like button. I know that you are all subscribed to the channel. Fun fact, YouTube has stopped serving my content to pretty much anyone that's not subscribed to my channel. It's true. Like 90% of the people who watch my content are subscribed to my channel. And guess what? YouTube does me the great disservice of unsubscribing people from my channel literally every single night. They, they get unsubscribed in batches. It's so fun. Um, so if you think if, if you think you might want to be subscribed to the channel or you th maybe even think that you are, just double check for me. I really do appreciate it. The subscriptions really help me out. Turn on those notifications and you might actually get notifications about my content every once in a while too. But let's jump into the main topic of the day, right? Which is this Joe Rogan standoff with Spotify. Now, a lot has happened. You know, so yesterday on our effed up news stream that I do on Sundays, it's a special stream where we go over some of the more screwed up news of the week. We talked about the fact that, first of all, Joe Rogan made a big mistake by apologizing. You never bend the knee to the woke, even if you're wrong. And I do leg legitimately think that Joe Rogan, you know, frankly, said some things he really, really, really shouldn't have. But that's actually not the point with the woke. The point is they're trying to get you to capitulate. They're trying to get you to submit to them. And once you do it once, they have you over a barrel forever and ever and ever. And there's never anything you can do to stop it. So he made a mistake there. And, <coughs> excuse me. And there's just been kind of like, uh, uh, what is it? Like, <coughs> Oh, God, sorry. <coughs> sorry, sorry to cough into the mic. There's just been like a domino effect going on since then with like new stuff coming out. And, and the big thing that happened last night after Joe Rogan apologized is Spotify's CEO sent this email out to their employees and, and Spotify's CEO, quite frankly, castrated himself in the sending of this email. And so what I want to do is read this and then we're going to look at some of the stuff that's been going on with Rumble and, and Odyssey's response to Rumble, which is kind of funny. Then we're going to read an article about Joe Rogan and why the, why they're so pissed at him and why this is a pivotal moment. But before we jump into this, the other thing we talked about in the stream yesterday is that, you know, the reason that you don't want Joe Rogan to apologize is this was a professional political attack on him. This is not just some random thing that just happened. This is a professional political attack by Democratic super PAC. And that's all the more reason that Joe Rogan never should have effing apologized in the first place. And I understand, man. I understand that Joe Rogan just wanted to do his podcast. I understand that he just wanted to talk to people and do his podcast and do his thing and hang out with his buddies. And I totally get and totally respect that. But the thing of it is, is sometimes we find ourselves in positions that we don't want to be in and that, quite frankly, might be a little inconvenient for us personally. I've talked about this countless times. I do not like being a public person. I was thinking about this last night. I was like literally crying myself to sleep last night, TMI, but I really was. I was having a night last night. Um, because I have legitimate stalkers on the internet, because that's what happens when you do stuff on the internet. You apparently get crazy, psychotic internet stalkers. And I was thinking about how my life would be measurably better right now if my article had never gone viral. My And I do truly believe this. My life would be measurably better right now if my Trump rally article had never gone viral and that had never happened and I stayed a private person and no one ever knew who I was and this YouTube channel didn't happen and, and all this stuff didn't happen. Now, does that mean that it was wrong of me to kind of step into this role when that happened? No, because it needed to. It needed to. This is a way to serve the greater good. This is a way to speak out on issues in a way that other people can't. And I am hyper aware that when I am forcing myself to get up and do YouTube, when I don't want to every single day, I'm not saying I don't want to ever. Sometimes it's really fun. And of course, I love you guys in the chat. But like there are days where I have to force myself to do this. And the way that I do that is by knowing that it is part of the greater good of the necessary that needs to happen. And maybe if I do it well and I'm able to create a lot of people like me who are fighting back and standing up against the woke nonsense and doing all the stuff, then I can start to take a step back and go back to my go back to my normal life which is what I really want at the end of the day. Now I'm never actually going to be able to get back there completely, but that's the goal. 
ultimately is to create more people doing what I'm doing to be able to do that. And so I, I tell you guys this story because I do actually have a lot of sympathy for the, the position that Joe Rogan is in. He doesn't want to be the, the, the one person holding the torch for free speech in this country. That wasn't what he signed up for. That wasn't the point of of doing his podcast he just wanted to talk to people and hang out with his buddies and it's like all of a sudden he finds himself holding the torch for all of us in this battle for for tech censorship and free speech so i fully understand that he's probably in a position that he did not want to be in but guess what dude that's why you're getting the hundred million dollar offers and sometimes you need to step up to the plate and play the role that you need to play but I want to start off this discussion by reading this email from Spotify's CEO that he sent out last night out to the staff at Spotify. It's a little bit long, but um, I'm going to try to try to do some commentary on it and why I think Spotify's CEO absolutely castrated himself, castrated himself with the sending of this email. This was a bad CEO move. Anyway, let's dig in. Spotify team. There are no words I can say to adequately convey how deeply sorry I am for the way the Joe Rogan experience controversy continues to impact each of you. Not only are some of you Joe or not only are some of Joe Rogan's comments incredibly hurtful. I want to make clear that they do not represent the values of this company. I know this situation leaves many of you feeling drained, frustrated, and unheard. It's important that you're aware that We've had a conversation with Joe and his team about some of the content in his show, including his history of using some racially insensitive language. Following these discussions and his own reflections, he chose to remove a number of episodes from Spotify. He also issued his own apology over the weekend, which of course tells us that Joe Rogan was the one that made the decisions about which episodes to remove. That doesn't sit well with me. That doesn't sit well. But we'll see. The email continues. Well, I strongly condemn what Joe has said, and I agree with his decision to remove past episodes from our platform. I realize some will want more. And I want to make one point very clear. I do not believe in that silencing Joe is the answer. Well, you already did silence him, though. You already did silence him. In removing over 100 episodes from his podcast... You did silence him. You literally did. So let's not play pretend that some censorship is better than more censorship. All censorship is bad. Just because you only censored a hundred of his thousands of episodes or however many he has doesn't actually mean that that censorship is not silencing him. You did silence him for over a hundred flipping episodes. We should have clear lines around content and take action when they are crossed by canceling voices as a slippery slope. Looking at this issue more broadly, it's critical thinking and open debate that powers real and necessary progress. Another criticism that I continue to hear from many of you is that it's not just about the Joe Rogan experience on Spotify. It comes down to our direct relationship with him. In last week's town hall, I outlined to you that we are not the publishers of the Joe Rogan experience, but perception due to our exclusive license implies otherwise. So I've been wrestling with how this perception squares with our values. And then the, the person doing this thread skipped a post, so we have to go down here. Including, hang on, is that the full picture? Okay, here it is. If we believe in having an open platform as a core value of the company, then we must also believe in elevating all types of creators, including those from underrepresented communities and a diversity of backgrounds. We've been doing a great deal of work in this area already, but I think we can do even more. So I am committed to an incremental investment of $100 million for the licensing, development, and marketing of music, artists, and songwriters, and audio content from historically marginalized groups. How many members in the chat of historically marginalized groups would like a record deal? Apparently, you can get one from Spotify just by being a member of an historically marginalized groups. Of course. Of course, this is what they did. What a massive virtue signal. This CEO just told his staff that his staff have the power to dictate the direction of the company. This CEO should be fired by the board of directors. 
He just put himself at the whim of his staff and made himself entirely feckless. This will dramatically increase our efforts in these areas. While some might want us to pursue a different path, I believe that more speech on issues can be highly effective in improving the status quo and enhancing the conversation altogether. I deeply regret that you are carrying so much of this burden, and I want to be transparent in setting the expectation that in order to achieve our goal of becoming the global audio platform, these kinds of disputes will be inevitable. For me, I come back to centering on our mission and unlocking the potential of human creativity and enabling more than a billion people to enjoy the work of what we think will be more than 50 million creators. This mission makes these clashes worth the effort. Then we go back up here. I've told you several times over the last week, but I think it's critical we listen carefully to one another and consider how we can and should do better. I've spent this time having lots of conversations with people inside and outside of Spotify. Some have been supportive, while others have been incredibly hard. But all of them made me think. One of the things I'm thinking about is what additional steps we can take to further balance creator expression with user safety. I've asked our teams to expand the number of outside experts we consult with on these efforts and look forward to sharing more details. Your passion for this company and our mission has made a difference in the lives of so many listeners and creators around the world. I hope you won't lose sight of that. He's basically begging his staff to let him stay. It's the ability to focus and improve Spotify, even on some of our toughest days that have helped us build the platform we have. We have a clear opportunity to learn and grow together from this challenge, and I'm ready to meet that head on. I know it is difficult to have these conversations play out so publicly, and I continue to encourage you to reach out to your leaders, your HR partners, or me directly if you need support or resources for yourself or your team. The staff at Spotify now have a very direct understanding that they have control over the CEO and that the CEO will bend the knee for whatever the staff want Never, ever, ever. I don't know why CEOs forget this. Your staff works for you. Now, I'm not going to say that if I was in the CEO's position, I wouldn't have done something to address this. I probably would have. I don't think I would have invested $100 million in, in people based on the color of their skin. That wouldn't have been my first inclination. I certainly would have said something. Maybe what I would have done is launch a series of workshops about free speech. Maybe what I would have done would it be more explicit in my hiring practice that your personal politics will not dictate the future of this company. The CEO shouldn't have apologized for the exactly the same reason that Joe Rogan shouldn't have apologized because now his staff know unequivocally that if they protest and they whine and they complain in their weekly town hall meetings, that they can get the CEO to do whatever they want them to do. This is a leaderless company. The CEO set the direction of this company by offering Joe Rogan $100 million in the first place to come exclusively to Spotify. Joe Rogan sold out, and I always thought he sold out for this deal. When Joe Rogan took this deal, I was kind of like, he's been doing this a long time. You know what? He deserves his payday. I totally get it. But any of us saw this coming. We knew what was going to happen. And Joe Rogan, quite frankly, is a really smart guy that's interviewed a lot of people, and he should have known this was going to happen, too. The CEO of Spotify, maybe I can allow a little a little leeway there for him not understanding that this would obviously happen. I don't know. But I think that this has put both of them in a really bad position. And I said so last night on Twitter. I wrote a little open letter to Joe Rogan. No, I don't think he's ever going to read it. But, you know, this is just what I was thinking about at 1.49 a.m. I said, dear Joe Rogan, I get that you're not in a position you want to be in right now. You just want to talk to cool people. I get it. But you're in it and you're the guy we have for the moment. But you need to either step up or sell out. It's time you have to choose one. You can't have both. If you step up, you own the free speech fight for real. Millions will support you because you stand between us and ruin. If you don't want that, then sell out. Take that sweet cash and water down your show. Just be honest about it so we can know if we can't count on you to step up. Personally, I hope you choose the former. Step up, be the hero we need. But I wouldn't blame you if you sold out. 
That's a lot of cash. You've been doing this a long time, and you didn't get in this for this fight. You just wanted to talk to cool people. But everyone is called to serve in a way that they can do the most good. You can help a lot of people here, possibly even save us from ourselves. We don't step up it's because it's convenient. We step up because it's necessary. So where I was last night in thinking about this was that Joe Rogan has two choices at this point. He can either kind of backtrack from that initial BS apology that he made and say, you know what? No, I may not have asked to be the defender of free speech in this country, but I am the guy with the FU money and the FU audience and I can do whatever the fuck I want and I'm not bending the knee to you people. I apologized for saying the bad things. Now we're going to move on and there is going to be no further censorship of my content. That is strategy number one. Strategy number two is that Joe Rogan continues to censor his content, completely waters down his show, and quickly becomes irrelevant as he pisses off the audience for getting rid of the reasons that they tuned in in the first place. But he gets that $100 million to Spotify cash, retires nicely, lives out the rest of his life as, 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 as that guy that used to have that amazing podcast that would say the things that no one else would say. Those are Joe Rogan's two options, except that they've now been made a little bit more complicated. Listen, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. Now, you guys know that I do have issues with Rumble. I do. I haven't hid them. I think there is a lot of improvement that Rumble could do. But I have to give them, I have to give Chris Pavlovsky uh, some credit here. Always give credit where credit is due. Chris deserves some credit for this particular maneuver. He posted this public letter today. Dear Joe, we stand with you, your guests, and your legions of fans in desire for real conversation. We'd like to offer you 100 million reasons to make the world a better place. How about you bring all your shows to Rumble? both old and new, with no censorship, for a hundred million bucks over four years. This is our chance to save the world, and yes, this is totally legit. So, one could argue that Joe Rogan could literally have his cake and eat it too. One could argue that Joe Rogan could sell out and get his hundred million dollars, but he gets it from Rumble instead of Spotify, and at the same time, steps up to stand up for free speech and what is right and what is correct. Now, listen, I don't know where Rumble's getting $100 million. To be quite frank, I don't understand how Rumble makes money at all in any way. I don't understand how Rumble has money to acquire. My, my understanding is that the acquisition of locals was like a stock deal. It wasn't actually like cash. I don't know if I'm correct about that. That's my kind of like you know, high level, not really paying attention understanding, but I thought it was a stock deal. So where the hell is Rumble getting $100 million? That's a question I have. But I like the balls of it. I do. Now, as a side note on this, Odyssey, and of course, Odyssey is, is of all of the alt tech platforms, not including Locals, because of course Locals is my favorite alt tech platform, even though Rumble owns them now, kind of like, well, technically, I guess. But like, Locals is my favorite alt tech platform, but of the video platforms, Odyssey is my favorite, by far. And it's not just because um, it's it's Jeremy Kaufman's, you know, Jeremy Kaufman founded library, which Odyssey is built on library. And of course, I'm helping Jeremy Kaufman run for Senate in New Hampshire. And he's an all around awesome guy and leader of Free State Project. Well, not leader, but he's like, he's like the face of it. He's he he does a lot of stuff. There are other people in charge of it, technically, I think. I don't know. Anyway, Odyssey put out this statement, though, because apparently Odyssey, one of the reasons I love them is they have snark. And they're so libertarian. Libertarians have their own culture, man. And they put out this statement in response to Rumble that I just thought was really funny. Like, literally, I was on the floor laughing when I saw this. They said, Dear Joe, we stand you with you, your guests, and your legions of fans in our desire for real conversation. So we'd like to offer you a hundred gazillion reasons to make the world a better place. How about you bring all your shows to Odyssey? both old and new, with no censorship, including criticism of Israel and Donald Trump, for a hundred gazillion bucks over four years. 
This is our chance to save the world. And yes, this is totally legit and not just a marketing ploy for attention. Sincerely, Julian, who's the CEO of Odyssey. I just thought that that was really funny. But apparently Odyssey has questions too. Odyssey's like, where are you getting $100 million? That's really what they're saying. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know where Rumble's getting a hundred million dollars. But listen, man, maybe they will be in a position to make a hundred million dollars very, very quickly if Joe Rogan brings all his content to their platform. I hope he doesn't. I think if if Joe Rogan does not take this offer from Rumble, that tells us a lot about where Joe Rogan's current priorities are. This is going to be the inflection point. Does because because he has a hundred million dollar offer, man. And let's just be honest: if if for some reason Rumble doesn't actually have this cash like they claim they do, Joe Rogan can go anywhere he wants and get a hundred million dollars. This is like the the money is not the problem here. The problem is: does he have the inclination to do it? And this is what I don't know. I felt like when Joe Rogan took the Spotify deal. That was his way of saying, I'm done. I'm cool. I don't need to do this anymore at the level that I've been doing it. I've built my audience. I built my brand. I make a good I print money with every episode. I can make as much money as I want in the world. I'm going to kick up, kick my feet back, and uh, just chill for the rest of my life until I retire. I thought that that was what the Spotify deal was. And so we're going to see if he stays with Spotify. I think we can all assume that Joe Rogan has just turned off his brain to doing this any longer. He didn't want to do it like that. He didn't want to be the bearer of free speech in the first place. And so he's just going to do his thing. And that's fine. And I genuinely mean this. That is fine. I get it. I think it is a perfectly reasonable choice. But, but. If he doesn't take this $100 million deal from Rumble, that tells us he's not really in the game. And what that is a signifier of is the fact that other people need to step up into that role. Other people are going to need to step up into his place. Who is that? I'm honestly asking in the chat, who is that that's going to step up into Joe Rogan's place? I don't know the answer to that. No, I don't think it's Jimmy Dore. I don't. A lot of people have said that to me over the last couple of days. I don't think it's Jimmy Dore. I don't know who it is, but I'd love to hear your answers in the chat. But we're also going to read this article from Technofog. The revolution has come for Joe Rogan. There is no forgiveness because they seek destruction, not restoration. And the reason I want to read this article is to really, really highlight the inflection point that we are in at this moment. Because this is more than just one MMA fighter and his podcast. This will tell us a lot about where this movement is going. So we're going to read that. But before we do, guys, please make sure you mount that like button for me. Please make sure you're subscribed to the channel on whatever platform you're watching on, whether that be Odyssey. I am streaming on Odyssey right now, as I always do. I'm streaming on Facebook. Thank you, my awesome channel, for the tip over on uh, Odyssey. I appreciate that. My awesome channel says Rumble is supposed to have a hundred million dollars because they are supposed to go public and they are supposed to raise a hundred. They're supposed to raise. Fi oh, Rumble thinks they're going to raise five hundred million dollars by going public. His first mistake was backing down at all. It's like running from a bad dog. You're begging to get bit. That's exactly right, my awesome channel. It's exactly right. Yeah, maybe Elijah could. Maybe Elijah Schaefer, Patrice. Maybe Elijah Schaefer could step up into that role. That'd be pretty rad. I think that would be great. So I want to read this article. Let's jump in. The Taliban took back Afghanistan in the late summer of 2020. In, in the yeah, in the late summer of 2020, shortly after fight. Am I? Hang on. I always forget to make this font bigger for you guys. I'm sorry. I gotta take care of you. Gotta be able to see. It also helps me read it. Okay, now we can get we can get going. The Taliban took back Afghanistan in the late summer of 2021, shortly after the Americans withdrew, tired and weary and broke after nearly 20 years of fighting. They seized control of the country in the broad and particular sense, setting up command in the presidential palace in Kabul and targeting the individuals who criticized the new government. 
By December 2021, regular Afghans and members of the Afghan press who expressed critical views of their new rulers have been subjected to months of intimidation and fear. The Biden administration has adopted these same tactics, calling for their critics to be silenced by the administration's corporate and media allies. After 20 years of trying to export Western values to Afghanistan, they ended up importing Taliban-style repression to the United States, and it only cost us trillions of dollars and thousands of lives. Now the regime and its comrades, excuse me, guys, my throat just got really, really, I've been having issues with my throat ever since, ever since I got nominated for governor of New Hampshire at the Libertarian Convention. Someone was sick at that convention. and It's not COVID. I had COVID already. All right. We're going to get it together. The Biden administration has adopted these same tactics, calling for their critics to be silenced by the administration's corporate and media allies. After 20 years of trying to export Western values, oh, we already read that. Now the regime and its comrades target Joe Rogan, an inquisitive comedian with a podcast. He is accused of spreading misinformation by those that illegally spy on their citizens and lie without remorse. In reality, this isn't about misinformation. It's that Rogan's crimes are those of words and thought. They prosecute on behalf of the God they have created, searching to eradicate those guilty of the sin of blasphemy. The Taliban would be proud. This guy's a good writer. We can be certain that the regime is not concerned with the truth. Have you seen them struggle to explain the evidence that Russia was planning a false flag in Ukraine to justify an invasion? Or consider how COVID-19 misinformation originated from the U.S. government and its bureaucratic arms. Check with the CDC for all relevant information. I can't talk about that because of YouTube sucking so bad. They killed the truth before. Who's to say they're not trying to do that with Rogan? These are easy observations. Then we get to the deeper and more consequential truths that are manipulated and deformed and remade for political purposes. Patterns emerge, and maybe they're repeating. The institution of marriage and the definition of marriage is subjected to social, meaning political evolution. Mothers are redefined as birthing people. Words are even disappeared by the U.S. government for threat that they are stigmatizing. Dare someone to have a negative opinion of an ex-convict or prisoner. To put it more bluntly, the people who believe men can give birth are now in charge of what is true. The only authority they have is political power. Such power isn't necessarily definitive, but it gives us the strength to set definitions and enforce the rules to declare guilt and issue punishment. Conflicts of interest be damned. Power over language is power over the people. The primary purpose of language, which is to describe reality, is replaced by the revival purposes purpose of asserting power over it. So we've talked a lot on this channel about how... The, the primary less the primary weapon that the woke use against all of us is their control of the language. They change definitions on a whim. They, they create words out of nowhere. Equity used to mean how much you had already paid in to own your house. Now it means something completely different. Microaggression wasn't a real thing until they created it. So they use language in order to gain power over people. And when the language that they created or that they've adopted or dare I say appropriated for their purpose, when it stops working, they simply change the definition of the word entirely or they introduce new language into the spectrum. This is what they're talking about here. We always have to keep in mind the reason that we never, ever, 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 ever buy into the definitions that the woke want us to buy into is because they will change those definitions on a whim if it suits them. You have to go by the definitions that you know are true, not what they want you to think. In their eyes, the public lynching is justified because these are revolutionary times and removing Rogan is a revolutionary act. There is no forgiveness because they seek destruction, not restoration. There is some limitation to enforcement power by means, those means by which they achieve their ends, necessitating the Biden administration in 
July 2021 to order social media companies to ban those who disagree with the official line of thinking. The U.S. government went so far as to flag the objectionable content itself, helping corporate America snuff out inconvenient voices. Supposedly devout Christian Francis Col- uh, supposedly devout Christian Francis Collins has been silent on the government's campaign to punish dissent, having been part of the cover-up. As Collins uses his faith to promote COVID-19 vaccines, perhaps he needs a reminder that Christianity does not give the civil government jurisdiction over your thoughts and words. Anyways, the censorship encouraged by the Biden administration was effective to an extent. And then they talk about some people who have been banned from uh, Twitter. Yet Joe Rogan thrived in large part because he provided an alternative platform to the voices that were being suppressed. The public yearned for this information and it was delivered through his podcast. It's reported that Rogan has an estimated 11 million listeners per episode. It's also estimated that his interviews with Dr. Malone and Dr. Peter McCullough brought in millions more. In response, the Biden White House demanded Spotify do more to censor the discussions of Rogan and his guests. At the same time, the liberal mob encouraged their leadership aimed at Rogan hurling disgusting and false allegations of racism. CNN eager to shift the focus off the network's own problems of losing 90% of their audience, their CEO and half of their employees being involved in sex scandals is asking Spotify to give Rogan the proverbial death sentence. And I think this is something that's really important that hasn't actually been discussed as much in the course of these events. It's not just Spotify that wants to censor Joe Rogan. It's not just the crazy woke left that want to censor Joe Rogan. It is the United States government. That's who wants to censor him. The United States government wants him to be censored. And this is why it is important that Joe Rogan step up in this moment and say no. Because he is the person in the position to do it. And whether or not he finds it convenient that he's in the position to do it, that does not even matter. Sometimes we are called to a greater purpose that is bigger than ourselves. And sometimes the call to that purpose is inconvenient. But it doesn't mean you walk away with your 100 million Spotify dollars. It means that you step up and you do the thing that needs to be done because you are the person that has been put in the position to do it. This is the same network that lied about COVID's use of a drug I'm not going to say, calling it horse dewormer. It is the same network that ran an altered video of Rogan making him seem sicker than he really was. No surprise that it's CNN Brian Stelter leading the way against Rogan. How do I describe Stelter? For starters, I do so with pleasure. He is a humorless fat man, a dedicated media believer pretending to be a media reporter. He is as dumb as he sounds and as arrogant as he looks. He oozes the sadism of a hall monitor and the false confidence of an imposter. He is Kim Jong-un without the hair or the country or the charisma. This is possibly right here. One of the most perfect paragraphs that I've ever read in my life. That was, can we all just give a slow clap to Technofog just for that paragraph? Slow clap for Technofog. Slow clap. That was awesome. That hit me right in the feels, man. It did. Prior to Rogan, Stelter's favorite targets were enemies of the regime. Tucker Carlson and Fox News, for being a media reporter, he typically thought he typically has a, a curious focus to target one journalist and one network. CNN tolerates this well, excusing Stelter's poor ratings because he attacks the network's adversaries and defends the network without question. Put Stelter on offense against his critics and he'll call a jihad against right-wing media from his CNN studio. He's a zealot that will behead you for drawing a cartoon of the wrong uh, left-wing figure, whether it's Joe Biden or Don Lemon, and then blame you for inciting violence on reliable sources the next day. He will demand the unvaccinated be treated as second-class citizens regulated to the margins of society until they comply with his favored health policies. Just as he continues on his own adventure of finding out what comes after morbid obesity. 
<clears throat> and in the presence of his preferred state power, Masochist Stelter emerges to flatter and grovel. When he had the chance to interview Joe Biden's pe press secretary, he lobbed the softball of his dreams. What does the press get wrong when covering Biden's agenda? Stunning and brave, Brian Stelter. But back to Rogan. One could say that Rogan is under attack for speaking truth to power, but that's not quite true. As Christopher Hitchens observes, the cliche is looking in the wrong direction because power already knows the truth. More importantly, Rogan and his guests speak truth to the powerless. And this is the point that I really wanted to get at in this article and why I think it's such a good observation. This is why they want Joe Rogan silenced. Critical race theory isn't about race, it's only about power. The audience that Joe Rogan targets is not the powerful, <clears throat> is not the media elite, is not the high and mighty. The people that love Joe Rogan are the powerless. The everyday people, the average person that just wants to kick back and watch an interesting conversation between interesting people and get the information that they need and hear different perspectives. The normal person stuff. The audience Joe Rogan has is not the one that's controlling the narrative. It's the ones that are on the receiving end of the narrative. And that's what makes Joe Rogan so dangerous to these people. Because he has the power to disrupt every plan that they've put in place in order to control all of us by focusing their media attention and allies on the same talking points that they issued every damn station every night. You guys have all seen these videos, right, of multiple news stations literally saying exactly the same thing because they all get their talking points from on high. Joe Rogan doesn't get his talking points from on high, and that's why he's so dangerous. That's what they're scared of. <clears throat> and that's why we see these campaigns against Tucker and Rogan and anyone else who will dare tell dangerous truths. To put it another way, President Biden and his corporate allies and their mob of supporters seek to obliterate the relationship between the reader, the writer and the reader and the speaker and the listener. Thus, this is more than Joe Rogan. It is about you. It is about me. It is about gatekeeping and limiting what we can watch and read and hear. And they archive that end through the uh, destruction of Rogan, uh, excuse me, they achieve that end through the destruction of Rogan as an individual. I see Lynn asking, where's this article? This article is on Technofog Substack. It's technofog.substack.com. You can go read the full thing. Go share it out. It is a great article with a great perspective. And this perspective, I hope Joe Rogan understands this. My perception of Joe Rogan is that he doesn't pay attention to a lot of the media, and I, I, God bless him for it. That's what you need to do in his position. I can't imagine. But I truly hope that someone gets this message to him. Because he needs to understand the position that he's in and the consequences of his actions. And now he's got a hundred million reasons waiting for him over at Rumble, allegedly, where he can both get his payday his cash cow that he's been waiting for. He will have the freedom to have any guests on his channel that he wants, talk about whatever issues he wants. He'll bring a lot of users over to Rumble, which, to be quite frank, I would be pretty excited about. One of the beefs I have with Rumble is I don't think they have enough people using the website. So if Joe Rogan's 11 million listeners come over to Rumble, I will be pleased as punch. I will be so happy. But We'll see what happens. It'll be extremely, extremely telling. <clears throat>